your phones with Bibles on it. Um, I want to ask you this question. Have you ever become good at something? Like, it's good. Now, you don't have to be the best at it, but you became uh, more than competent. You became pretty good. Maybe it was a sport. Maybe it was an art. Maybe a musical instrument. Maybe it's a skill. Maybe it's a certain role you play in your job or something else. Have, how many of you would say, I have become good at something? I have become. Now, some of you might think, I don't, I don't know right offhand, and that's okay. Uh, how, how did you become good at it? Practice, right? You practice. And what did you practice? <laughs> practice becoming good. <laughs> you practice the basics, right? So I become good at something, skilled at something by doing the basics over and over and doing them well. How did you know that you became good at it? How, accolades, right? People said, well done, right? Someone said, you're good at this. How else do you know you're good at something? When you feel comfortable doing it. Okay, so no longer is it, man, this is, I'm lousy at this, but yeah, I'm, I'm getting pretty good at this. Like, it, it's, I'm more familiar with it. I feel like I can do it, right? What else? Results. That's how you know you're good at it, right? Like, if you're playing uh, um, golf, which I've only played once in my life, and by the way, I played like with a team of four, and all of them have played a lot. And I we we're playing best ball, and I got out there and I hit in the very first hit. <laughs> I'm not a player. Very first, whatever you call it, swing. I had the best ball, and I thought I was born for this. I have missed my calling. I did better than all these guys who play all the time, and I got the best off the first hit. And that was the last time I hit it, like on the. Anywhere, wherever it's supposed to go. Like, I was the worst after that. So, uh, you, you get results. If you're playing something and you're getting better at it, you're seeing better results, you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this, right? And so, this, I mean, this is true with, with anything in life. You get good at it. So, we're talking about growing and progressing in our faith. We've been talking about this lately. Now, we don't typically say, Hey, I got good at Christianity. I got good at being a Christian. You know, like we, we're not trying to become good little Christians in that sense. But there are other ways that we would say this. Like I have grown stronger in my faith. I have been strengthened in my faith. I have grown in my trust. I, you know, we use terminology like that. It would be similar to saying I'm getting good at this, meaning what? I, I believe God more. I believe more things truth about God. I understand more of that. Um, there's certain beliefs that I'm growing in. There's certain actions that I'm taking now that I didn't always take before. And so I'm, I'm praying more, right? I, and I feel like my prayer is not just hitting the ceiling and bouncing down, but I feel like I'm connecting with God. I'm spending more time in his word. I, am, I, I spend time worshiping God throughout the day and singing. You know, there's certain practices that we are doing, and as was mentioned, I feel comfortable doing these things. And, or, and maybe I'm praying and getting results. Like I'm here, I'm seeing my prayers answered. I'm feeling like I'm led by the Spirit of God, like I'm praying and asking for wisdom, and I'm getting it. So those are indications that I'm getting good at this. There are certain virtues. So we have beliefs, we have practices, and we have virtues that really are key for us to grow. And we always want to be uh, looking at those things it, um, as indicators of how am I doing. For example, the fruit of the Spirit. Man, I'm, I'm walking in love more. I feel like there is a, a, a compassion on the inside of me for people that has increased. I used to judge people sitting on the corner, and now I, I look at them, and uh, I know that's someone's son. That's someone's daughter over there. Some parent's heart is probably broken, and instead of just judging and being critical... Now my heart uh, thinks about these things. Like maybe you haven't taken the step of and doing something yet, but the heart is warming up. It's little steps. Maybe you have taken the step to, to give and, and help them out or to whatever it is. Uh, the humility. Man, I used to respond right back to somebody w when they would say something to me, but now I'm able to... <laughs> you know, bite my tongue and think, okay, I, I don't need to respond like that. Those are indications that you're becoming good at this, right? And so for all of us, there are, there are ways that we can, uh, we, we can measure 
am I growing or becoming better at following Jesus? Though we don't typically put it in those terms. But why don't we think about our growth that way? Why don't we think about our relationship with God? The most important thing that you can become is like Christ. (laughs) And why don't we look at it with an idea to say, I used to be here, but now I'm there, but these are the things I need to, you know, practice to get even further along. This is eternal. This is what matters. And this is, you know, our our creator who has made us, and we're going to spend eternity with him to fulfill his purpose, to fulfill our purpose in our life, to know him. We should be pursuing growth. We should be able to look at our life now and and then look back at it a year, two, three years ago and say, there's been change that has taken place. I may not be all that I can be or I'm called to be, but I'm sure not what I was, right? He's not finished with me yet, but he is working on me. And so we've been talking about this for the past several weeks, about the ways that God uses to shape us. And we talked about this, first of all, work. He uses our career, and these are things that you're thinking, oh, I, you know, surely he doesn't want me in this job with all these terrible people. Uh, he might, <laughs> and he might be using those people to shape your heart and character. You're going to have a job anyways, uh, ho- hopefully at some, life, some point in your life, and, and you're going to have a vocation, something you're doing, even if you're retired. All of these uh, oppor- are opportunities for you to respond to God and invite him into your life. This is one of those basic ways that God uh, uses to shape us. There's also trials, temptations, and, and promotion that comes our way that shape us and give us opportunity to grow in our relationship with God. So when there's hard times, God says, I'll be right there with you, and if you will place your trust in me, I'll get you through it. When there's times of temptation, that's a test in our heart. Are we going to choose the Lord or not? And we keep, having, we keep having temptation, and the more that we overcome it, the stronger we become. There's also the promotion, which is the greatest test of all when you get you know, the accolades, when someone does pat you on the back, when somebody says, you're good at this, how do you respond? You want to test a man's character? Don't give him hardship. Give him praise, and that will test his character what he's really about. So when you win the award and you get your trophy, how, how will you respond to that? Is it a humility and a, and a thank you, Jesus? Or is it, that's right, finally they see it too, right? <laughs> what I've known all along. Uh, nevertheless, these are ways that test us and tempt us. Uh, or te- test us, they tempt us, they, they prove what's on the inside of us. We talked about this, how, how Jesus modeled um, He modeled love through sacrifice and serving. And so how do you grow in your faith? Well, part of it is sacrificing for others, and the other is serving others. And so these are just ways. I want to keep talking about this. Is that okay? I think it's important. In conversation with many Christians, I hear this. I don't really have a plan to grow. I don't know how. So many times people come and they're like, I I know we're supposed to read the Bible and pray, but where do I start and how do I even do that? And who do I do that with? And and how do I know if I'm growing? That's what I want to help you with. I mean, I hope you come out of here encouraged and inspired and, and, you know, somebody loves on you and makes you feel good about yourself. I hope that does happen. But really, I hope you come out of here thinking, okay, I can do this too. I can do this too. Because so many times people are in church and, and they don't know that they can do this themselves. They think, it's just, I go to church. But no, you can, you can grow in your faith every single day. You can do this. Tell the person next to you, you can do it. So you didn't say it, but they can do it even if no one told you. Dane, you could do it. All right, did you find it, open your Bibles yet and go to that scripture I didn't tell you to go to? Okay. Uh, in order to grow in our faith, we must strengthen our faith, not just for things, but in Jesus. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. Uh, John is writing at the end of his book here, and he starts to sum some things up, and he tells you the purpose of why he wrote. He tells you the purpose of why he included certain things, but he doesn't tell you till the end, which means that you're going to have to go back to the beginning to really get this. 
But verse 30 and 31, I want us to read this out loud and loudly together from the screen so that we all say the same words. Let's, let's, say, let's say it. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John says this, Jesus did a lot of stuff. He did a lot of signs, a lot that aren't even included in this book. But I have included these signs in this book, in this order, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and in believing, you may have life in his name. John is writing so that you would believe. If you want to strengthen your faith, you can look back at the signs that he wrote about, and they will point you. What does a sign do? It's an indicator, typically a road sign is an indicator of something to come, or it's directional, or it helps you become aware of something, right? It's a warning, whatever it is. It's, that's what a sign is. And he says, I've given you, I've written down these signs, and all of these are associated with the miraculous. But he said, I've given you these signs. I wrote down these signs so that you would believe, so that you would believe in Jesus. So if I want to strengthen my faith in the Lord, it's important for me to take time to read these and to understand and allow God to speak to me. In Romans, it tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so if you want to strengthen your faith, you want to be in the word of God, reading the word, listening to the word, right? These are the ways that we build ourselves up. What is my plan for growing? I'm going to get in the word of God. If I want to grow in my faith in Jesus, I'm going to take time reviewing these signs. I'm going to go back and say, what signs is he talking about? And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. John actually identifies seven signs that he writes about. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to walk through these, and we're going to take a moment just to dig into them, because at the end of the day, I want to believe Jesus more. I want to grow in my faith. I want to know him more. I want to see the things in the Bible happening in my life, the good things, right? There's other stuff in there like, I don't want that part. I want that. that's, that's for the unbeliever. I, I want the believer part, right? So here's the first sign. Turn with me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and uh, it, it is the... It is the, um, the wedding. Here's, here's where we're going to go. I'm going to actually turn there, and I'll read it to you, verses 1 through, oh, we're going to go all the way through 11. It's going to be on the screen. I, I try to put the scriptures up there, but not always. Um, so take notes. Write it down on your Bible. Do something along those lines. But here's, here's the first sign that we're going to go to. Now, now, by the way, signs are meant to confirm uh, they're, they're, they're given to confirm that God is with somebody, right? They're meant to confirm that God is behind that, like with Moses. In the Old Testament, you see God gave Moses signs um, to confirm that he was behind what Moses was saying. So you remember Moses said, uh, how, will I, how, how, do I, how will they know that you are with me? that you're the one that's, that's telling me to do these things. And he said, well, you take your rod, and that rod, you know, you drop it, and it turns into a serpent. He said, stick your hand into your, your bosom and pull it out, and, you know, it turned leprous. And then he also said, um, when, you, when you go out and you take, you, you're going to basically turn the water into rivers of blood. And, you know, all of these things are some of the signs that happen to prove that God was with Moses. Well, with Jesus, God gave uh, signs as well to prove who he was and what he's doing. So the very first thing we see, very first sign, chapter 2, John, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone, according to the matter of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, 
the master of the feast, called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, when the guests, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This is the beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Okay, so let's just break this down a little bit. Here's the setting. It's at a wedding. And this is a huge social event that's taking place for them. I mean, this isn't like a private little wedding. They don't do that back then. There, it's major planning. The guest list, all the, the, uh, the food, the organization of it. It's a multiple day event when they're doing these weddings. They would invite the whole village out. All eyes are on the host. And if you blow it in one thing, you could bring a lot of shame on yourself, on that family. You could actually even end up getting uh, into a lawsuit that, that there would be some type of judgment against you or the groom side because you did something like running out of wine and you embarrassed the family and you were not fit for my daughter. I mean, this is a big deal that's taking place. I don't know, you know, if you've ever seen Bridezilla's, but I imagine that we had them back then too. And this could have been a disaster to run out of wine. And, you know, then we see this, the woman. We have the setting is the wedding, but when then there's this woman mentioned, right? Who's that woman? Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we don't really know why she's the one bringing this up. She may have been the host. She might have been assisting the host at this wedding. But it says this, now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited. When they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. Which, what miracle took place here? What miracle takes place in a minute? Changing water into wine, right? Uh, if you're Baptist, it's changed wine into water, however you want to say it. But nevertheless, and uh, <laughs> here we go. <clears throat> that was a cheesy pastor joke. And um, some of you guys appreciate it, and some of you are like, no, that's no, true. Um, <laughs> but here we have Jesus and, and his mother. She says, they have no wine. And Jesus responds to her, and he says, woman, is that what he said? Now, we read this, and we think, how can you answer your mom like that? I, this is not a term of like, woman, what's that got to do with me, <laughs> right? He didn't say it like that. It's, it's, it's woman. This is a term of endearment. This is a term of respect there, though, you know, he'd be like, mom, but he's 30 years old. So he's not like, mom, why are you talking to me? He, it's, it's woman. This is like saying, saying, madam, you know, like that, but not like madam, like he Heidi Fleece, madam, like madam, like respect and honorable, like this woman right here. And, and so he's showing her, but he says this, woman. What does your concern have to do with me? What does your concern here have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now remember, Mary, if you've read the story about when he was born and there's some prophetic words spoken over him, there's talk about how uh, his life is going to be given for others and it's going to pierce your own soul as well. And she treasured these things in her heart. And she always knew, like, of course, that this, there's uh, a destiny on him and she doesn't know when. And so maybe at different times she's trying to prompt him, saying, Jesus, Son of God, you know, do something, right? And so this is an opportunity where she's like, this is a big deal right here. And sometimes we can think temporary things are a really big deal. How many of you have faced something that seemed like it was huge and life-threatening and, and, oh, man, this is going to be a disaster, and then it kind of, it's like that, threat of a hurricane that just turned into a little storm when you look on back on it. Like, man, it wasn't that big of a deal. Even if you lost something significant, you realize, I can make it through tough times. I can make it through hard things. And so Jesus says, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus is pointing her back to his mission. While she's thinking about something that is temporary and she needs some temporary help, He's saying, my mission is to ultimately go to the cross of Calvary. And it's not time for that yet. You have, you're looking for my help with these temporary needs, and you need to remember, I have an eternal plan. And it all has to uh, lay out in the right order at the right time for the saving of the world and your own soul too, Mom. 
And so there's something that he's tenderly reminding her about who he is and what he's after. And he's getting her back on track. Mom, I have an eternal purpose here. But what I love about Jesus is that he can take his eternal purpose and he looks around and he says, but how can I reveal it in this really simple, temporary way? Because they just knew that they needed wine. But God here is saying, oh, but I'm going to show you something much greater than that. I'm going to show you what you need. And I'm going to, I'm going to help you out in a temporary way. But if you will listen closer and look deeper, you're going to see something that is everlasting right here. The significant thing that God is doing. And that's true of our lives as well. There's little things that are happening and we think, oh, no big deal. But God is behind it and he's wanting to show us something bigger than that. So here we are and Jesus, Jesus is redirecting her. And what does he do? He gives a sign. This is the first sign. The old things are made new. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is what happens when Jesus shows up in our life. Old things pass away. All things become new. He performs this first sign right here to demonstrate the old things passing away. That the old covenant was passing away. That the old way of religion is passing away. This old way of trying to approach God, that it's passing away. And all things are becoming new in him. Verse 3, they have no wine. They have no wine. Jesus, they have no wine. This isn't just a, a party problem right here, but it speaks to the condition of their soul. And what they have, it's not satisfying. What they have, it's ran dry. This wine represents life, it represents abundance, it represents fullness, and it's run dry. Whatever it, it was supposed to bring them joy and fulfillment, it's gone. Wine is often used in covenant in the Old Testament and New Testament. Wine and bread, it's brought out saying, saying hey, I, God is doing something new in your life. And Mary brings up not just a party problem, but a theological issue as well. They're, they have no wine. That's a major problem for them on the natural level, but it's even a, a worse problem spiritually. Verse 6 says this, that there were six water pots of stone, and what were they for? For the purification of the Jews. It was for their purification rituals. So they had water that was meant to purify. They would go through these, these little processes. They'd walk by, wash their hands, walk by, wash their hands. And it would symbolize, oh yeah, we're pure now. But the reality was they were no cleaner when they finished than when they started. There are people who live their lives doing religious things, but it isn't transforming their hearts. It's not changing their lives. They're going through the motions. They've got traditions. They've got these rituals. They do all of that, but it isn't saving their soul. It's not transforming their hearts, and it's surely not going to uh, change the world. Jesus looks at this, and he says, they have no wine. <laughs> Here's their old way of doing some things. I think I've got an opportunity right here. And so he looks at these six water pots, and, and uh, he tells the servants, grab those things. Fill them up with water. Fill them all the way up with water. Do what you can do, right? But what you can do isn't enough. Do what you can do. Bring that over here to me. Brings him the water pots there. And uh, he creates wine, and that, turns that water into wine. He, the wine from that, that sim, in the symbol of, of Old Judaism, right there, Old Covenant Judaism. He says, you have looked to this to make you right with God. You have looked to this, and this is your, your efforts, your ways, your traditions. I'm going to turn this all around right now. So he brings it, he brings it to them, and uh, he turns this water into wine. And he says, take it to the master of the feast. As they do that, they're realizing this wine this wine is so much better. He said, most people bring out the good stuff in the beginning and so that the, you know, the guests drink that and then they give them the cheap stuff afterwards. But you saved this best stuff until now. See, the Old Testament, we, they thought maybe that was the good stuff. But then the new covenant that Jesus made through his, his blood, the new covenant, the promises of God that came through Jesus, he's saying, this is actually the better stuff. 
And he takes the symbol of the old way of doing things and the ceremonial purification water, which ultimately failed to cleanse people. He takes that right there and, and he transforms it right here. And he, in doing that, in this very first sign, Jesus is declaring that the old covenant is passing away. The old way of doing things is passing away. Jesus, if you were a guest here and you were uh, privy to all of this going on, it would be as though Jesus takes you by the hand and says, the old way of doing things is passing away. The old way of you trying to reach God and be good enough for God is passing away. The old way uh, of jumping through the hoops and performing, it's passing away. He's inaugurating this new kingdom right here by turning the water into wine, and he's doing it in their own, their own uh, pots of water, in their own house there, in their, own, their old way. And he says, oh, I'm going to turn that upside down. I'm going to turn this water into wine. I'm going to make old things new. Now, why is this a sign? You know, water into wine, why is that a sign? There's a lot of other things Jesus did, but why would this be such a big deal? When this happened, it says the, the disciples believed in him. If you look back in the book of Isaiah, you'll see something that is mentioned about when God shows up on the scene. And in Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6 or 7, it says, And in this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the lees. Whatever these are. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all the nations. What he's saying is there is, there is a darkness that covers people. Jesus will lift that. He'll break that. Verse 8, he will swallow up death forever. Isn't that good news? And the Lord God will wipe away te all tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people will, he will take away from the earth. For the Lord has spoken, and it will be said in that day, be Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Jesus, in turning water into wine and bringing this wine in abundance, bringing this wine that is superior to all the other wines, when he shows up, it may seem subtle, so subtle that people could miss it, but it's a very clear sign that the Lord of hosts just showed up. That the Lord of hosts came with salvation. It's a very clear sign that he's saying, hey, I'm bringing the, 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 the good wine in abundance to the party. I am now the life of the party. Jesus is showing up right there, and he's saying, I am doing this. I'm bringing the wine, but eventually I'm going to destroy death forever. Soon I'm going to wipe away every tear from their face. Soon you'll recognize that I am the Lord, the God who saves us. This is the first sign, and John is pointing this out to his readers and saying, when Jesus turned water into wine, right there, the new kingdom was introduced by the new king. This isn't just simply a party trick. This isn't just, you know, Jesus' mom shows up and says, they have no wine. And the disciples were like, sorry. <gasps> you know, it's not like that. <laughs> this is something significant that is taking place here. Wine was abundant, 120 to 180 gallons of great wine that Jesus just made, and it was, it was superior to everything. You see what's being revealed here? It's the glory of Jesus. You see, this was a sign that Jesus was declaring that he was the Messiah, and he came to establish a new order. Those pots that were filled for ceremonial washing, they were transformed into vessels of fruitfulness abundance, joy. They're filled to the rim with new wine that represents a new covenant. The Messiah has come. The old is gone. The new has come. Now here's the response. In verse 11, it says this again. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So you are invited guests. John is writing this, and he's inviting us back to this wedding. And God expects that you'll see his glory. And he expects his desires 
that not only will you see his glory, but that you'll believe in him like his disciples did. So here's the question. Do you see his glory? When you read these things, do you see his glory? Moses, if you look, remember back in Exodus, he begged God, let me see your glory. And God said, oh, I'll have to cover you with my hand because you can't see the fullness of my glory. But in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The disciples, they saw his glory and they believed. Now, there were other people there who saw the glory. They saw the, the impact, but there's no mention of them believing. They just saw that, oh, there's better wine here. Suddenly, they got to partake in the benefits, but they miss out on the glory and the believing. And God is putting this in the scripture, in this order, writing it so that your belief, not believe in God just four things, but that you would believe him and you would believe in him and your faith would be strengthened. If you're a believer, this sign calls you to see the glory of, of your Savior who has made a new creation, who has made you a new creation. When you look at this and you see, oh, he turned water into wine there. That's what he's doing in my life. He's taking the things that were so mundane and limiting and weak and making them new and powerful and transforming my life. The old is gone, the new has come. He is making me, he has made me a new creation. There may be some of us here who are yet to believe in Jesus, yet to believe in Jesus. Maybe there's a nudge on the inside, maybe you're interested and you're growing, but even in that situation, he's wanting to reveal his glory to you. Because all of these people, this was, for the most part, this is the first like, real understanding of who he is. And he's introducing himself, and he's saying, hey, all the self-help books in the world, they're not going to change you. All the, you know, the behavior modification, it's not going to improve your life to what you want. The things that you're doing to try to get free, it's not going to set you free. How you're trying to overcome the addictions or bondage or find the fullness or that one thing to fit the big hole on the inside of the heart, uh, they're still going to leave you unsatisfied and longing on the inside. Outside of Christ, we're spiritually dead. Outside of Christ, we're incapable of saving our own souls, finding, finding the, the wholeness that he has for us. Here's the deal, though, in the same way that he's saying, I could do something, I can change, not just, I didn't make that water taste better. Jesus doesn't come into our life just to make our life better. Sometimes people add church or they add Jesus to their life like he's a side dish. And he says, no, I'm actually the whole meal. I'm actually not just the whole meal this one time, but, but I'm the only <laughs> nourishment that you need. I, I am all of that. He doesn't come just to make our life better. He does make our life better. But he doesn't take water and say, I'm going to make this water taste better. He changes its very essence. He brings about a total transformation of what it is. And this is what he's saying to, to those of us, maybe if you're, if you're not yet believing and trusting in him, this is saying, I want to actually not just help you. I'll help you in these little things, but I want to change and transform your life. But you've got you to see who I am and what I'm doing and place your faith and your trust in me. That new wine is symbolic of the new covenant. It's symbolic of forgiveness. It's symbolic of salvation. It's symbolic of the blood of Jesus. It's an exchange of the unrighteousness or the self-righteousness for God's righteousness. This is what he's doing. We're trading the bitterness of our sins for the, the goodness of his forgiveness. This is what is taking place. And John is writing these things so that you would catch it, that you would see the transformative power of Jesus right here. This is the background to this very first sign. This is kind of the overview. But here's something that I want us to do is take a couple minutes because it's nice to understand the scripture and see some of these things uh, when you hear somebody else. But we've got to process these things on our own and respond to them, right? And I mentioned to you that, um, that we, we like to talk about things. Uh, 
I want to do two things. I want to take a moment at the end for you to pray with to be able to pray and respond to the Lord as appropriate as you feel like you need to. Um, But here's the deal. How do I grow in my relationship with God? How do I read the Bible? How do I understand the Bible? How do I learn it? How do I process it? How do I discuss it with others? I want to give you a tool to do that. And you might think, well, how are these connected right here? Well, I'm going to give you a background to these signs that will grow your faith and help you. But you've got to own this, and I believe that we grow in community. And so we hear these sayings, and the, Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So that's not, just not me and Jesus where he's teaching me these things, but it's me and other people. Um, and so I want to give you a very simple tool that will help you in reading, learning, understanding, and discussing the Bible. And it's basically four questions. Four questions that you can ask, and and these are designed so that anybody, regardless of if you've ever read the Bible or you know anything at all uh, or not, these four questions will help you dig into it. And so these four questions are this. What does this say to me when I read the passage? What does this say to me about people? Second question, what does this say to me about Jesus? Third question, what does this have to say about me? And here's a fourth question. Who needs to hear this story, or who do I need to share this with? So this is what I'm going to ask you to do, because I hear this feedback, and I think back of what's the most important thing I can help people with. I can help people learn to read the Bible, engage with Jesus, and do this with others in community. And so giving you a plan on how to grow, I want to continue to give you tools for that. I want to practice this right now and take a minute at your tables, or if you're in the rows, to break up into you know maybe two, three, four people. And we just read that passage. You can either A, reread it together, or since we read it thoroughly and we talked about it, uh, I want you to ask those questions. This isn't a time for you to be the teacher or the sense of, hey, let me just tell you all this other great stuff I know, but for all of us to reflect of, what does this say about me? What does it say about people? What do I see that this says about, about God and who, who needs to hear these things? So anybody can bring this to the table. And I tell you, uh, I, I, I lay it out simply like this because there are people who you know who would love to understand the Bible more and read the Bible and get to know God. And I want to make it as simple and accessible to everybody as possible. And if we can practice it here in church, then we'll be able to practice it outside when people are talking, when we're talking about the Bible, talking about God with others. And so let's do that right now. Let's take about 10 minutes to break up into our groups at your tables or your chairs, rearrange them, and walk through those questions together.